Good morning to everyone. Thank you for joining in as we continue studying God's Word together. It's just a privilege that we have. Um, just think about it. We're able to uh, freely engage in studying God's Word. We have that privilege, and we want to use that privilege rightly and uh, to the glory of God. So we're going to be in Daniel chapter 10 today. And um, before we get into that, though, um, I want to I, I thank Kate and TJ. I think they did a, a good job on handling the difficult passages last week with all the 70 weeks and the 62 weeks and all that kind of stuff. Um, the seven weeks and 62 weeks within there. Um, so, uh, you know, uh, when you're kind of going through passages like this, um, where there's no complete consensus within the Christian community, I think it's, it's good to hold on to our ideas loosely. Um, we want to be faithful to what the Scripture says, but when we don't have a completely clear understanding, we want to you know, hold our conclusions uh, loosely uh, and not be dogmatic in, in a way that would be like, oh, well, everybody else is wrong, and we have the right interpretation on, on, on these things. So when you're looking at things, uh, there's a pretty good agreement in the Christian community. Um, I'm speaking about chapter 9 before we get into chapter 10, uh, verses 24 and following, that the weeks that are talking about are not supposed to be taken literally, they are seven periods of time or 70 periods of time. All the weeks are, are symbolic of periods of time. And 70 is, is a symbolic number within that. So there's two kind of main interpretations. Uh, one would be, uh, you know, Cyrus gives a decree to go and rebuild Jerusalem. Uh, and then there is, it's rebuilt during times of trouble. Uh, which we see in Nehemiah, and then there's uh, the rise of Antiochus Epiphanes, who sets up a temp, uh, an idol, an altar to Zeus in the temple, sacrifices a pig on the altar. There's trouble and uh, uh, revolving, of course, around that. And Antiochus Epiphany becomes a, a pre-type of the Antichrist. Um, and then there's, uh, of course, uh, Jesus' birth, and then um uh, his death on the cross it looks like satan's victorious to an extent but then there's the resurrection then titus destroys uh the temple in jerusalem in ad 70 and then eventually uh, uh hadrian con conquers jerusalem in ad 135 however so that's one interpretation another is type of, more of a typological in which um Cyrus sends out the decree again. The temple is, is desecrated in 167 BC by Antiochus Epiphanes again. Uh, then you have Jesus' uh, birth and incarnation, death and resurrection. So that's part of the seven weeks. Then the 62 weeks is symbolic of the church then in its restoration. The temple itself is destroyed again in AD 70, but then... When you're t talking about the church, it, the church would be as Jerusalem. It's symbolic of Jerusalem. Um, and that continues on with the preaching of the word and sacraments. And then uh, that last final week is the Antichrist almost destroys the church and the gospel. Uh, and then Christ returns and delivers the Christians and vanquishes Satan and the Antichrist. So there's, you know, there's multiple interpretations of this. I wouldn't get too wrapped up in, in those things. The thing to keep in mind is the, the time frames, the weeks, are time periods. And also, as Kate and TJ pointed out, you know, there is going to be trouble. There is going to be things. But God is victorious in the end. That's the, that's the assurance that we have. That's the message that we have. So we're going to dig into Daniel chapter 10. Let's have a word of prayer. And then we'll dig into that. Father God, thank you so much for this time together, the, your word that is truth. We pray, Lord God, that you would guide and direct our thoughts, our words, and deeds. And during this, uh, this season of Advent, that we would really prepare our hearts for the coming of Jesus, 
that we would look to him. He is the author and perfecter of our faith and that we've gained strength from him. And also, Lord God, that we would proclaim him during this time. There's many people uh, during these, th these, this season of, of the holidays that maybe become depressed or are down. Help us to reach out to our neighbors to really check in on them and share the love of Jesus with them. So as we dig into your word now, we pray you would be with us in Jesus' mighty name, amen. Daniel chapter 10, we're going to do the whole thing, and, the, and this is a prologue uh, to other things that are coming. In the third year of Cyrus, king of Persia, a word was revealed to Daniel, who was named Belshazzar, and the word was true, and it was a great conflict, and he understood the word and had an understanding of the vision. In those days, I, Daniel, was mourning for three weeks. I ate no delicacies, no meat or wine, or entered into my mouth, nor did I anoint myself at all for the full three weeks. On the 24th day of the first month, as I was standing on the bank of the great river, that is the Tigris, I lifted up my eyes and looked, and behold, a man clothed in linen with a belt of fine gold from Uphaz around his waist, his body was like burl, his face was like the appearance of lightning, his eyes were like flaming torches, his arms and legs like, uh, like the gleam of burnished bronze, and the sound of his words like the sound of the multitude. And I, Daniel, alone saw the vision, for the men who were with me did not see the vision, but a great trembling fell upon them, they fled to hide themselves. So I was left alone and saw this great vision, and no strength was left in me. My radiant appearance was fearfully changed, and I retained no strength. Then I heard the sound of his words, and as I heard the sound of his words, I fell on my face in deep sleep with my face to the ground. And behold, a hand touched me and set me trembling on my hands and knees. And as he said to me, O Daniel, man greatly loved, understand the words that I speak to you, and stand upright, for now I have been sent to you. And when he had spoken this word to me, I stood up trembling. Then he said to me, Fear not, Daniel, for, for from the first day that you set your heart to understand and humbled yourself before your God, your words have been heard, and I have come because of your words. The prince of the kingdom of Persian, Persia withstood me 21 days, but Michael, one of the chief princes, came to help me, for I was left there with the kings of Persia and came to make you understand what is to happen to your people in the latter days. For the vision is for days yet to come. Continuing in verse 15, When he had spoken to me according to these words, I turned my face toward the ground and was mute. Behold, one in the likeness of the children of man touched my lips. Then I opened my mouth and spoke. I said to him who stood before me, O Lord, O my Lord, my, by reason of the vision Pains have come upon me, and I retain no strength. How can my Lord's servant talk with my Lord? For now no strength remains in me, and no breath is left in me. Again, one having the appearance of a man touched me and strengthened me. And he said, O man greatly loved, fear not, peace be with you. Be strong and of good courage. And as he spoke to me, I was strengthened and said, let my Lord speak, for you have strengthened me. Then he said, Do you know why I have come to you? Uh, but now I will return to fight against the prince of Persia. And when I go out, behold, the prince of Greece will come. But I will tell you what is inscribed in the book of truth. There is none who contends by my side against these except Michael, your prince. All right. So this is a prologue to then he's going to tell him what is to come. That's in chapter 11. Unfortunately, Kate and TJ are going to uh, be given a lot of uh, information here that's uh, kind of complicated historical stuff that's going to be going on. Uh, but anyway, this is a prologue to all of that. And I want to kind of give you the setting. It says, in the third year of Cyrus, king of Persia, that's verse 1 in chapter 10, a word was revealed to Daniel. So uh, the edict, Cyrus conquered the Babylonians, the great king Cyrus of the Persians. He conquers the Babylonians. And then 
two years before this, Cyrus gives an edict in 538 BC that the um, some of the rep, some of the captives from Israel could return back home. So they go back to Jerusalem. Daniel doesn't go. This is two years after that edict that they could go. Because well, one of the reasons Daniel might not have gone is maybe he's too old. Maybe he wouldn't. They wouldn't let him go because he's too valuable to the kingdom there. Whatever it is, he's 85 years old now. So he's up there in years, uh, and he's left behind. And um, he probably hears of the difficulties the Jews that have returned to Jerusalem are facing. Uh, because they do face opposition when they go back. So in, that, in those days, it says in verse 2, I, Daniel, was mourning for three weeks. Now, we also see later on in this that an angel was resisted in coming to him for three weeks. So there may, there's probably a, a deep spiritual connection also. Uh, Daniel is mourning for his own people and the difficulties they face. He's interceding for them. But what, who placed that on his, on his heart? And I think he has a deep spiritual connection and he understands there's some struggles going on and he's connected with God in that, in that, in a very deep way. And so there's all these things happening. There's these physical realities that are going on that are around him, but there's also a spiritual struggle that's taking place. A de uh, demons and angels in battle. I think he has an understanding of that in connection with that. So he's, he's mourning, he's fasting, he's not even anointing himself with oil, which in a very dry climate like that, you need to keep your skin from cracking and, and, and um, drying out too much. And so he's not doing any of the normal hygiene things that he would do. And then suddenly, uh, um, one who is clothed in linen appears, face like burrow, eyes like flaming torches. Um, so this is an, an angelic being that comes uh, before him. And um, he loses his strength. This is just so overwhelming to him. All his color goes out of him. He loses his strength. He doesn't have any strength. And uh, he has to be touched. A hand touched me, it says in verse, verse 10. And he sent trembling on his knees, his hands and knees. Um, and the angelic being reminds him, hey, again, Daniel, you are greatly loved. Isn't that beautiful to know? Isn't that beautiful to know that for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal love, life? Isn't it beautiful to know that you are greatly loved by God? Daniel was reminded, because sometimes we need to be reminded of that. I think a lot of times we need to be reminded of that. The world presses in, the troubles uh, of what we're going through, what's happening in the world around us, presses in upon us, and we need to be reminded that we are greatly loved in and through Jesus. Um, and so this hand touches him, O oh, Daniel, man, greatly loved, understand the words that I'm going to speak, and stand upright, for now I've been sent to you. And... Um, he says, this is beautiful in verse 12, Fear not, Daniel, from the first day that you set your heart to understand and humbled yourself before your God, your words have been heard. What a great consolation for us in a life of prayer that as we seek the heart of God and we humble himself before us, he hears our prayers. He cares for us. He hears our prayers. And I've come because of your words. And he says this, this is very interesting because this is one of the few places where we're revealed to kind of things are torn open and we're seeing that the struggle is not just a physical struggle that we're in, but it's a spiritual struggle 
and there is actual battles taking place between uh, angels and demons. And um, we see here the prince of the kingdom of Persia withstood me 20 days. This is not a physical prince of the kingdom of Persia. This is a demonic being. This is something that is very important uh, for us to comprehend. The powers of the world arise and fall. And, and the people who would assert themselves as the dictators of the rulers of the world cause all kinds of chaos, all kinds of problems. And, and something has driven them to this madness. It's destructive madness. You see it throughout history. This goes on and on that these, these uh, human rulers arise, but they're driven with a absolute demonic uh, drive to, uh, at all costs, to accomplish what they think they want to accomplish. And it leads to so much pain, so much suffering, so much destruction. So this prince of the kingdom of Persia is a demonic being behind the scenes of those who are uh, seeking to conquer all kinds of people and, and assert their power and authority. So I think we ought to remember this, that our battle is, as it says in Ephesians chapter 6, our battle is not against flesh and blood, uh, flesh and blood but against the, sp the spiritual powers in the heavenly realms this this we have to remember there's a demonic spiritual component to the battle that we face and what is going on behind the scenes daniel is revealed this to an extent um so um he says that michael though came this this angel says that michael came to assist him and and to, came to help help him Michael is the archangel that is in charge of the armies of the Lord to protect Israel. Uh, and he would be protecting us in, uh, the, as the branches that are grafted into Israel. So this is, this is, this is a spiritual battle that's, that's going on. And we ought to praise God and thank God that he watches over us. That in the midst of this battle that we're facing... It's not ultimately against flesh and blood. Um, so, <coughs> um, when he had spoken, verse 15, when he had spoken to me these words, I turned my face to the ground and was mute. He couldn't even, couldn't even speak at this point. So overwhelmed by all, everything. And it says, this is a beautiful thing uh, here as well. He has no strength. Uh, Everything, like he says, no breath is left in me. He's just like, he is overwhelmed. And verse 18, one having the appearance of a man, one uh, came and touched me and strengthened me. And he said, O man, greatly love, fear not, peace be with you. There are two occasions, at least, and I can think of in the scripture, maybe more of just off the top of my head, where angels came and ministered or strengthened Jesus himself. One was in the wilderness. If you look in Matthew chapter 4, uh, about Jesus um, being tempted by the devil in the wilderness. And at the end of that uh, temptation where Jesus resists that, it says that angels came and ministered to Jesus after his 40 days in the wilderness. But we also see... In the Garden of Gethsemane, when Jesus is going to be on the night of his arrest, and he's praying fervently, pouring his heart out to God, uh, Lord, if it is possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not my will be done, but your will be done. It says that an angel came and strengthened him, strengthened him for what he's going to face. Angels are there in service to us. To God's people 
to strengthen us. There's going to be difficult times we go through it, uh, in, our, in this life, in this fallen and sinful world in which we live. And we need supernatural strength. We can't do it on our own. In fact, if we try to do these things on our own, we will fall flat on our face. We will have no strength. We won't be able to speak. We won't be able to do anything. It, we need the strength of the Lord. God sends angels to minister to us in the midst of those troubles that we're going through and gives us strength to persevere, to go forward, and to know that we are greatly loved by him. So Daniel had to be reminded of this in the midst of this, but I think really this opens our eyes to there's a spiritual struggle going on in the heavenly realms around us. It's not a battle ultimately against flesh and blood, what we see in front of us, but it is a spiritual battle that's taking place. And we need to be connected. How, do we, how are we going to fight this spiritual battle? Uh, not in our, with the, with the uh, uh, weapons of the sword, uh, but it's the gospel that overcomes. Is it a, I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation for those who believe. It's the, it's the dunamis of God, the dynamite of God, the power of God for those who believe. And so uh, we don't wage our warfare with politics, with the sword, with military power, with political power, with uh, our scheming and manipulation. Our power that we're given is the power of the gospel. We have to recognize that we need to be in prayer, that is the Holy Spirit that is going to lead us and guide us, and that um, God is watching over us. He sends angels to minister to us in the midst of this. So I want to encourage you in that as we finish up Daniel in the next few days, uh, that um, you know, as all these things are unfolding, as these terrible things or events occur, the rising of kingdoms, the falling of kingdoms, that God is in control and that God is with you and you are greatly loved by God and that ultimately your battle is not against flesh and blood and you need to be in prayer and connected with the Lord and realize what he has given to us for the battle, the power of the gospel. So I want to leave you with that thought. Let's pray. Father God, thank you so much for your amazing grace. Fill us with your spirit, Lord God. Lead us and guide us. And to recognize that the, the power that you have given to your people, to your church, to the body of Christ, is the gospel, the good news that is found in Jesus, our Savior. May we go forth, Lord God, armed with the gospel, pointing people to Jesus, who is the author and perfecter of our faith. We pray this in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. God bless you all. Have a great day.